Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg. Hello, Belgium. Good morning from Tacoma. Hello. It's Easter morning and uh, it's so great to have you with us. Let me show you the time quick. <laughs> Starting to regret this already. Uh, so the time locally is uh, Eight, eight, oh Lord, 8.48 a.m., and we will begin our discussion of supervolcanoes at the top of the hour. If you're watching this replay, go ahead and skip ahead 12 minutes, and you can have us begin at that time. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a moment of inspiration this morning, just a few minutes ago, and thought I'd try this uh, chalkboard position. Only problem is, oh wait, I can move the, hang on. So the sun is, uh, yeah, this might work. <clears throat> So I had some trials and tribulations yesterday with Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> that was quite comical. So I want to make sure that uh, that we are fully functional here back uh, back where I belong on YouTube. So I think I'm asking you right now uh, for those that are commenting. Um, is the text readable? Is it backwards or is it readable? How's the audio this morning? We feeling okay? Looks good. Words are forward. I love it. I'm, oh, this is good. Oh, this is good. Oh, nice. Thank you. Um, it was an adventure yesterday. I'll tell you about it quickly because we have uh, 10 minutes or so. So as many of you recall, if you've been a regular visitor here, um, I was invited to uh, broadcast through Facebook uh, Learning Geology Facebook page, a uh, wonderful young man named Kasim from Pakistan. And I, uh, I met him last fall uh, in Phoenix at a conference, and so uh, I really wanted to do that, mainly for him to try to get some traffic heading his way, but I don't think he needs it. He's got a lot of people watching over there, around the world, but people watching his stream. So anyway, Kasim and I, uh, on Friday, I guess, you know, it's like, 13 hours later where he is, so it's like 11 p.m. there, and it's 9 a.m. here, or whatever, the 10, I guess it was. So we're Skyping, and he's like helping his uh, grandfather, basically, <laughs> uh, figure out how to do things, and um, so we thought we kind of had it figured out, and then uh, I came out here yesterday morning, again, on Facebook, so if you didn't catch any of this, it was just only in the Facebook scene, but I broadcast uh, uh, just impulsively through my Facebook page, just hit live for the first time on Facebook. And I thought I would just check it out quick before I broadcast through the Learning Geology site. I thought I'd, you know, just like, like I do with you guys, just check, check the text, check the audio. And uh, everything was mirrored through Facebook Live, not mirrored this way. And it turned out to be like a 45-minute live stream where I'm like learning uh, as I'm reading the comments and it's so kind for people to help me out. My cousins back in Wisconsin are typing in and Frank uh, in the neighborhood here. And uh, <laughs> So it's still there if you want a, if you want a good laugh because it, it was a clown show. It was a clown show. And, you know, I'm not... I'm not a, a 
embarrassed about looking like a fool, obviously. Um, so that was that was really uh, interesting. So we're back to YouTube, and I and I, I'm, I'm feeling like I want to make sure that things are good. I was, uh, I think the video quality is better through uh, YouTube. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll read these comments later. They're too fast now for me to read, but I think originally I was broadcasting YouTube Live, and it was like HD. And then I think I read that YouTube around the world uh, has kind of like gotten rid of the HD uh, to get us through this pandemic and to not have uh, whatever, uh, crashes or whatever. So um, I think 720p, if I'm... I don't really know what I'm talking about now, but I think that's the the kind of default setting. But it was it was I think it was 300 or whatever the lower um, resolution is for the Facebook Live using the same camera. Using maybe there's some sort of default in the. Oh boy, we got neighbors uh, doing Easter egg hunts, and we got some tears. Mary's Mary's sad right now. Hey, the Easter Bunny came here. I was setting up my chalkboard this morning about 20 minutes ago, and I, I the Easter Bunny came. And uh, the Easter Bunny really came. So whoever you are, Easter Bunny, wherever you are living in Ellensburg, thank you for the surprise this morning. I know kids are watching, so I'm not actually saying the Easter Bunny lives in Ellensburg, but thank you, Easter Bunny. So let me read a couple quick comments and see uh, how things are going. Good morning, Jody. Jason, I recognize some of these names. Francois, hello, whatever that emoji is. I think it's, uh, yeah, okay. Um, Long Valley Caldera is hopping, really? Well, well, uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Uh, guten Tag, or is that right? Good Morgan, Francis. Uh, Marion, Illinois, uh, uh, Iowa, thank you. <laughs> Idawa, that's my fa wife's favorite, like mi mixing Idaho and Iowa. Puyallup, Grandpa Carl, good morning. Hey, let me, uh, let me show you the schedule for next week. Is that sun gonna? I think it'll be okay. So here's the plan. We're gonna stick with our usual schedule. What's, what are the shadows? Oh, the wires are making a shadow? I promise I'll hold it still here for a second. Okay, so um, I won't see you on Monday as normal. Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific time, Seattle Geology. Wednesday, 6 p.m. Snoqualmie Pass. I didn't realize there were two queues in Snoqualmie. That's interesting. Uh, Thursday, 6 p.m. Yakima River Canyon. Won't see you on Friday. Saturday, back to our 9 a.m. sessions. Columnar Basalt. And Sunday, 9 p.m excuse me, 9 a.m. plate tectonics of some sort. Okay, so I'll, I'll remind you all of that and I'll post that around a little bit. Seems like uh, we have a nice community here. We have a lot of regulars and, uh, and uh, that's, that's terrific. Morning. It's perfect weather here. Dead calm. 45 maybe, and gonna be in the 70s, I think, this afternoon. I, um, for 20 years, I've been singing at the Easter Vigil Mass over at St. Andrews. There's a big proclamation, and I'm always real nervous. 
got my little flashlight, you know, the, the lights are out, the candles are out, literally everybody's holding candles and a paper plate, you know, inside of the church. So it feels very different this year, of course, for all of us. And uh, whatever your um, routines are and traditions are and whatever your spiritual routines are, I hope, uh, hope you're able to tap into some of that regardless today. I don't know why I'm giving you so much airtime here. Awfully cute. I'm losing my mind here. What, what is this day? We did the first one on St. Patrick's Day, right? Coming up on a month, aren't we? Morning. I I keep fighting a shadow here, and I oh I guess it's that. All right, well that'll be gone soon enough. I'll I'll try to remember to be on this. Morning. So there'll be some ambient sound this morning. We've got uh, Easter festivities. Muffler boy, I'm sure, is celebrating in his own way. Morning. Um, laptop is functional. One minute, let me collect my thoughts. Thanks for joining us. Well, good morning to you. Happy Easter. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, my backyard here. Uh, this is live stream number God knows what, and uh, I'm happy to be with you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about super volcanoes this morning, and I hope that you enjoy it. As many of you know, I am place bound, and I'm not talking about the virus thing now. I am, I am a Pacific Northwest person, and it's my choice to stick pretty close to home. I want uh, deep uh, knowledge uh, applied. I'm talking to myself now. And as soon as we leave the Pacific Northwest, I'm either rusty or ignorant or both, if that's even possible. So you may have a very specific question about a supervolcano uh, on another continent or in Colorado or something like that. And I I will try to answer your question, but I'm, 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 I'm not trying to provide a disclaimer, but I do want to say that my plan is to talk specifically about a supervolcano story here in the Pacific Northwest. 
And as usual, these are uh, abridged or no, uh, yeah, I guess so. I'm condensed versions, um, loose versions of these formal YouTube lectures that I've given over the years. And I did one last April called Super Volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. And it's received a lot of attention and uh, including some negative stuff that I forgot the super volcano in New Zealand. And you're right about that. So we'll talk about that. The New Zealanders were not happy. But uh, I do have a story from that lecture that I think hopefully will work for you, especially if you haven't heard it before. And as usual, after about 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit more, we'll turn to your questions and I'll do my best with super volcano question and answer. Okay, wonderful, let us begin. I think our first task is to make sure that we understand that supervolcanoes are very different than other kinds of volcanoes. And I think a mistake we can make right off the bat is start thinking about a certain volcano that's a favorite of ours, but it's not the topic of our discussion today. So many of you have seen something like this before from me. I've done it a number of times over the years. What I'm, let me annotate, and just in case you haven't seen this before, uh, this is my way to describe the different kinds of volcanoes on planet Earth. There's lots of different kinds of volcanoes, but to me, this is the most simple way to talk about three broad styles of volcanism. And it all depends on how much silica is in the magma chamber. In the magma itself, in the kind of liquid magma, how much silicon and oxygen is in that uh, batch, if you want to think of it as a batch of magma. 45% silica, add more silica, you're up to 60%, add more silica, you're up to 75%. And these are real numbers, by the way. There aren't any magmas on planet Earth that are, have lower than 45% silica or higher than 75% silica. But there are some mid-ranges in here. So you can have a magma system with 61 or, or, or 53%. Okay, so there's a continuum between these guys. This is our topic today, way over here on the right. But before we get there, in other words, these are the super volcanoes that we're going to discuss for the rest of the hour. But let's realize that we do have uh, volcanoes that have 45% silica magma. When they erupt, they produce basalt lava. And when you cool the magma chamber off beneath a shield volcano like this, Hawaii, Iceland, that's fine, in an oceanic setting, uh, you create the rock gabbro. Do you want to see what a basalt looks like? I think you've seen it before. Let me show you a couple samples quick. Here's some basalt from Hawaii. How much silica? 45%. And as a result, when this lava with 45% silica magma came out of the ground, it was very runny, it was very fluid, and all these little holes are the gas bubbles that are escaping through this runny lava. Here's another basalt, this one from Washington. I shouldn't have said that because it violates our rule that we're talking about, but again, we're looking at low silica, runny lava basalt. Okay, not the topic today. If we add 15% silica to our magma system, and now we're up to a total of 60% silica, suddenly we're no longer in the oceans, and this is a global pattern. There's plenty of exceptions, but this is a global pattern, Geology 101 land. And so along the margins of continents, where we actually have a mixing of ocean crust and continental crust, oftentimes in a subduction zone, where an ocean plate is diving beneath a continent, you create this intermediate magma, 60%, and this stuff is a little bit stiffer. So as you increase the silica content, you increase the viscosity, the stickiness of the lava. And so our volcanoes are gonna be more cone-shaped and more vertical than these shield volcanoes. So these are composite cones or stratovolcanoes. And there's lots of different kinds of lavas in them, but if we have to just pick one, we'll pick some andesite. And if we cool off the magma down below, well, that's a diorite. You wanna see some andesite? If you're a longtime viewer of our live streams, you've seen all these. These are all just things I've been, I got half the geology department uh, in my backyard by now. I've made so many trips back and forth. So you can see there's some light colored minerals as well as some dark colored minerals. The black things are hornblends or amphiboles. 
And uh, this is what a good looking andesite looks like. So if you wanna visualize what rock looks like inside of Mount Rainier, this is a, a decent uh, rock to visualize. We're still not talking about super volcanoes, but uh, we're almost there. In fact, we're there now. So what happens if you leave the oceans and you even leave the coasts and go into the heartland, go into a truly continental setting? And continental crust, by the way, is very thick, 70 kilometers thick on average compared to ocean crust, which is only five kilometers thick. And so if we have a heat source heating up an ocean crust, we're not gonna make a super volcano. To create a supervolcano, we need to be in a continental setting. We need to be melting continental crust. And if we do that, we can create a magma chamber full of the highest possible silica that we have on planet Earth. 75% silica magma. So this stuff is gonna be like toothpaste. It's not gonna to wanna to flow at all. There's not gonna be any vesicles at all inside of this, this uh, uh, continental magma. And the kind of rock we're talking about here today is rhyolite. You want to see some rhyolite? So please notice there isn't any black mineral content in here at all now. So these rocks are getting lighter and lighter in color as we go towards the right side of that chart. So you're looking at what we call felsic magma. What you're looking at is a rock made out of 75% silica. And this is the kind of rock, this is rhyolite that you're looking at. And this is the kind of rock that's produced with a supervolcano. Now this is truly just rhyolite lava. And you can see a few, I think the light's pretty good, isn't it? I think you can see some, are those diamonds in there? Well, no, be cool if they were. These are little quartz crystals, little miniature quartzes. Qu crystals was the wrong word. Okay, but this is our topic today. And not only is it true rhyolite lava, but sometimes you get a rhyolite welded tuff. You wanna see a welded tuff? Glad I can't see the comments. If you actually type N-O, then what do I do, just leave? Well, this one's even labeled conveniently for us. Welded tough, okay? So you're like, oh, okay, well, this looks pretty much exactly what you just showed us before, I think. And this one's been uh, cut by a rock saw. Did you know, I'm talking mainly to kids now, did you know that we can actually cut a, a rock in half? And we, you can use a rock saw if you've ever seen uh, somebody in the garage or the basement of your house and mom or dad and they're using a circular saw and it's really loud and it's cutting through a bunch of wood. We've got bigger saws that are circular and they've got little diamonds on the, on the bits uh, around, the, around the, 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 the saw blade. And we need those diamonds to cut through rock like this. Uh, but there is a difference, and I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up or not, but there's kind of a, there's kind of a, do you see kind of a, uh, I won't say layering, but do you see kind of a hint of some organization to some of this stuff? So this is rhyolite, same minerals as a normal rhyolite. Yeah, Patrick, we do have a rock saw in the, uh, in the geology building. I, I don't think I'm bringing that one into my backyard. So there's something going on with this welded tuff that gives us a feeling for what happens with a super volcano eruption. Uh, again, these are loose. I'm, I'm kind of thinking as I go. I think I want to follow through on welded tuff, rhyolite, what's the difference, and... Yeah, I think I want to do something else on a whiteboard, and then we'll do story time with the Pacific Northwest. That's what I've decided. <sighs> All right. I got a bunch of rocks here, and there's that J up there. It's Easter. I shouldn't do that. Okay. So... What happens, oh, sorry. 
So why do I have a question mark here? Do we, why do I have a question mark there? A scientist has never seen a supervolcano explode. We've never seen it. We have no recorded history, human recorded history of a supervolcano explosion. Early humans did see a supervolcano explode a little more than 25,000 years ago in New Zealand, the Tupau supervolcano, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But we don't have human experience with people writing things down or even telling oral traditions of a supervolcano. But we have a decent idea what happens when a supervolcano erupts because of the deposits that are left. So you know how this works in science. You need data, a lot of data, and then you can tell a story if it fits your data. Well, we have a lot of data about these prehistoric supervolcano explosions. But it's one of those where you can't say, well, yeah, we could go Tuesday. This happened in Kamchatka. And so obviously we can compare today with the past. Doesn't work this way. Humans have never recorded a supervolcano explosion. So that's why this question mark is here. And yet, based on that data that we have, let me give you a pretty accurate view of what's happened many times with supervolcanoes around the world. And yes, what will be happening in the future, if you want to play it that way. So the first thing to say is it's a sunny day. The second thing to say is that we have a supervolcano about ready to explode. And all we have is this dinky little plug, this little dome. Uh, there's one of these uh, in southern Idaho called Big Southern Butte. That's always what I think of when I, when I think of a little rhyolite plug like that. Big Southern Butte, right along the Oregon Trail in southern Idaho, north of Pocatello, west of Idaho Falls, out on the Snake River Plain. That's a rhyolite plug, maybe a thousand feet high. Hardly anything. And yet, this is a site of a former potentially, uh, let's not go there. So what happens? Super volcano explosion. Well, this plug, first of all, is made out of this rhyolite, so it's this, it's this pink stuff. Sun's changing on me now, I think I got it. So here's our idea. Okay, let's start the explosion. By the way, do we have weeks of warning before this? Uh, thousands of years of warning? We don't know. We've never, we've never been through it. Okay? So whatever the time frame is, we've got some steam, we've got some uh, ash, we've got, we've got some action. And we think the first major event is a collapse. That we evacuate some magma and we create the, a collapse of the, the roof of the magma chamber. And the reason we think that is one of the hallmarks of a supervolcano explosion is a big old crater, a caldera. So instead of a cone, instead of a shield volcano, we don't want to visualize those today. Those are not supervolcanoes. We're over by the question mark and only with the question mark and only with the continental setting. And when we finally do this thing and do a super volcano explosion, we blow up that plug, we pulverize it, we basically blow it up with dynamite, that goes, a bunch of the surrounding rock goes, and we convert that rock into ash. And this is ash that is so voluminous that it has no it doesn't matter what way the wind is blowing that day. We're sure of this. From the deposits that we have from super volcano explosions, we see ash falling in all directions around a circular caldera, not just downwind. That's different than the Cascades, for instance, which we'll talk about a second on the map. Okay, let's finish the story about what we visualize based on the data that we have. This incredible mushroom cloud, I guess, but it's even bigger than that. I mean, this thing is just like filling the whole sky from, from uh, skyline to skyline with ash. 
We'll talk about volumes as well compared to Cascade Volcanoes in just a bit. But the next thing I want to emphasize is that not only are we getting a big crater that's like 30 miles across, and not only are we collapsing that crust back into the magma chamber, so this is a collapse feature, this caldera, but I want to use a different color. But at the same time, I guess, a bunch of this ash is a ground-hugging cloud. And this is bad news. This is a, this is a white-hot, gas-charged cloud. Probably more than 60 miles an hour. In all directions, I'm just going like east and west, right? But I'm, I'm really talking about in all directions, away from this erupting supervolcano, do we have this ground-hugging cloud. And there's a bunch of this ash that's falling out of the sky as well from this amazing cloud. For sure, the sun is blocked out. This is all happening in the dark, essentially. And we're really talking about 100 miles in all directions from a crater, a caldera, that we have uh, everything wiped out. Plants and animals, gone. Trees, gone. Everything completely killed. A hundred mile radius around a caldera. Well, how do we know that? Uh, how do we know that? Let me squeeze a little map in here. So this is a map. This is looking down now on a super volcano that has exploded in the past. And these are the super volcanoes we have discovered that we have found by geologic mappers out there walking around. Well, of course, they find this circular caldera looking down from heaven, okay, 30 miles across. If it's a recent enough supervolcano, you can still see the caldera. It's not buried by anything, for instance. And then surrounding that, about 100 miles in all directions, I should use my color scheme, this is a disappointing marker. I have a love-hate relationship with markers. I'm making a donut now on Easter morning. So this is not a happy scene because we have these, we call these ash flows or pyroclastic flows. Maybe you've heard that term or ignimbrites. Maybe you've heard that term. Uh, the point is we have all this action uh, surrounding this caldera, the ground-hugging cloud, and it finally comes to rest and makes welded tough. So I'm describing with the red here what we think happened to create the welded tough. But what's the evidence for what I'm describing to you? Well, we have a calderas that we've mapped, and we've got 100 miles of welded tuff surrounding it. And as a geologist, as I did 30 years ago for my master's thesis in, uh, outside of Yellowstone Park, oh, here's some welded tuff. Dink, 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 dink. I'm going to collect some of this welded tuff. I'm going to send it to a lab. I'm going to get an absolute age date on this welded tuff. And if I can do that, then I can come up with an age for a prehistoric supervolcano explosion. So primarily the dates we have for these supervolcano explosions, because nobody saw them, are the absolute age dates from the welded tuff that create this 100 mile halo surrounding a caldera. Last comment, and then we'll go to story time and then we'll come to you. More colors. I'm feeling, I'm feeling festive this morning. It's appropriate for this morning. We not only have the, the ground-hugging cloud and the caldera that's forming, but remember we had this mushroom of ash that's getting sent up into the heavens. How tall, how big, some physicists have kind of worked on that. I don't really know what they came up with. 
But we also then, oh, sorry. So so I'm sharing with you that we can map a caldera. We can map the welded tuff where sometimes these welded tufts are so dense. I mean, it's amazing. They were this, they were this, you know, rolling cloud of death with ash and gas and everything else it picked up, but then it comes to rest and it's so hot it welds together, really hard to break open with a sledgehammer even. But then my blue here is this ash, ash ash, and that's just falling down, typically on top of the welded tuff. And of course this ash is gonna travel way beyond the 100 miles away from a caldera. So back to my map here, I've really kind of screwed it up but we have found this ash fall. So this is ash flow in red. This is ash fall where the ash is truly coming out of the sky. But there's amazing amounts of ash fall up to a thousand miles. I'm not exaggerating. Up to a thousand miles away from a super volcano caldera can you find a particular ash fall of a particular age. And quite often you can find not only the ash fall in blue, but the ash flow in red, matching in chemistry and matching in age. How we doing? Okay, that's the background necessary to then tell you a very specific story here in central Washington. We're doing okay on time. And this is Mount St. Helens ash from 1980 sent in from I think his name was Jim, I'm sorry. Jim from Afreda. And uh, the ash from a super volcano looks just like an ash from a composite cone volcano. Oh, two, you're, I lose the light if I get... Anyway, okay, I can't get too close, right? That's gonna, I guess you know what ash looks like. Get my head out of there. Screw it, all right. I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna eat ash this morning for it. Okay, story time. I've set you up for the story. This will go, I think, pretty quickly. Map of the Pacific Northwest. You've seen it a million times if you've seen some of these live streams before. Where are the Cascades? And what kind of volcanoes are the Cascades? You know the answer to both of those questions. The Cascades are here. And we have about a dozen of these cone volcanoes in the Cascades. Getting used to my new setup here. Cone volcanoes here in the Cascades. We know that's a subduction story. We know that. We had a, a session or two on the Cascades. My point today is... We have plenty of ash that fell out of the sky from prehistoric cascade eruptions and even historic cascade eruptions. Mount St. Helens, 1980 from Afreda. It's fine ash. It's only found to the east of the Cascades. Why? Well, these are quote unquote minor eruptions. I know some are killers, so I don't, don't, don't slam me on that. But compared to a super volcano, these are babies and the ash is being blown to the east, and we have lots of different ash fall deposits from thousands of years ago that we can trace back to the St. Helens or Adams or Baker or Three Sisters or Lassen or Hood. We can, we can trace them back to individual mountains. There's a way to do that now. You can actually get some chemistry on those ashes, and it's a, it's a chemistry match game. There's like a chemical fingerprint an isotopic fingerprint for these ashes. And you can say, well, that's a part of the Mount Hood that blew up and got blown downwind. But my point is it's only found to the east of the Cascades. 
And so we can talk about Mazama, we can talk about St. Helens. It's a cascade, cascade, cascade story. Pause for dramatic effect. There's a layer of volcanic ash that clearly fell out of the sky 35 miles from my backyard here in central Washington that's not from the Cascades. 30 feet of ash. I mean, St. Helens that fell here was a quarter of an inch. St. Helens that has fallen from Mount, Maz I'm sorry, Mount Mazama ash that fell in Spokane is a couple of feet. But 30 feet? I mean, geologists found that ash bed. I'm talking about south of Vantage near a little town called Mattawa, if you happen to know it, in central Washington. It's a quarry now. It's private land. 30 feet of this ash, the geologist that found that ash, you know, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, said, I don't know, must have been one heck of an eruption in the Cascades, just assuming that all the ashes were coming from the Cascades. Well, it turns out we now can do chemical fingerprinting of the 30 feet of ash and realize it has nothing to do with the Cascades and everything to do with a supervolcano. Barbara Nash has a tephra chronology lab at the University of Utah, and she has all these tephras, all these ash fall deposits from across the Pacific Northwest, I think even beyond that, and she has this amazing database to say, oh, that sample, that's from that volcano. That sample, that's from that volcano. So Barbara got some sampling, sampled it herself, and I think had other colleagues involved. They sent samples from that 30 feet of volcanic ash, sent it to the lab in Utah, and they go, well, that's got nothing to do with the Cascades, and it has everything to do with the Bruno Jarbage caldera in southern Idaho, a supervolcano. There's our caldera, 30 miles across. There's a welded tuff, 100 miles in all directions. And ash fall, do we still have our sketch? Caldera. Welded tough, ash fall in blue, 30 feet of it up in Ellensburg, near Ellensburg. Ash falling in Nebraska from the same supervolcano, the Bruno Jarbage Caldera. We have a, not only a chemistry match, and we know the source of that 30 feet of ash in central Washington, but we have a very precise age, thanks to Barbara and others. The date of this ash is 11.81 million years old. So that means almost 12 million years ago, there was a supervolcano explosion in this location that sent ash and made a plume of ash, just a mushroom plume, uh, going that far away from this ground zero spot. Now, I know you want to talk. I'm guessing you want to talk about why there was a supervolcano explosion there. That's the last thing I want to do with you. But I think we're going to go into the cozy fort. Because we made another expensive animation. If the Jays would shut up. I got it queued up and everything. So I've got a different blanket. Will it work this time? Who knows? Happy Easter, everybody. Oh, it's so cozy in here. Oh, I don't think the bunny's gonna find us in here. Oh, what's happening? Why am I crawling under a blanket with a older man? Inappropriate. Mute it. Parents, mute the audio right now. Uh, I should have practiced this. This is the same problem I had before. <laughs> Am I going to give up again? Wait a minute. This is supposed to work. Seriously, this is supposed to work. 
Right there. That's all we need. Right there. I'm talking to myself. And now I'm holding this up. And I'm hitting play with my tongue. I don't know. All right. I got I to hit play. I got to back up and hit play. I don't know. All right. I got I to hit play. I got to back up and hit play. I don't know. All right. I got I to gotta hit play. I got to back up and hit play. It's so self-indulgent. Hey everybody, welcome to Nick From Home. This episode brought to you by YouTube. You gotta love it. Okay, I'm backing up so we can get, I can get my blanket set up properly. I'm cranking the volume. Brown layers are found all through central Washington, from Dry Falls to the Gorge Amphitheater, from Hell's Canyon, all the way down to the Oregon coast. But what's with that white layer close to the top that's sandwiched between basalt lava flows? The white layer is volcanic ash, 30 feet of it. I repeat, 30 feet of volcanic ash that fell out of the sky. That's been a puzzle for a long time. Is this from the Cascades? For a long time, nobody could figure it out. We now know the chemical details of this volcanic ash. And there's a perfect match to a volcano 500 miles away in southern Idaho, not the Cascades. This is a super volcano story, not a Cascade subduction story. The super volcano produced an amazing amount of volcanic ash, more than 1,000 times the volume of the famous 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption much of the American West showered in fine volcanic ash. So yes, it's true. The scale of these super volcano explosions is off the charts. But in this ash, we have tiny little details preserved from 11.8 million years ago. Raindrops falling through an ash cloud, the rain turning to hail, the hail getting coated in ash and being perfectly preserved as accretionary lapilli. Right here. Look at those details. These hailstones are gone, but the ash coating remains. Thousands and thousands of accretionary lapilli. The most recent supervolcano explosion on Earth was 70,000 years ago. Wrong. What did that scene look like? What did it sound like? What did it smell like? We don't know the details because humans have never seen a supervolcano erupt. Wrong, wrong, wrong. My glasses steamed up. I was in the cozy fort with you. I think I was drooling too. <laughs> All right. All right. Happy Easter, everybody. That was fun. All right. I got one more thing I want to do with you. I'll do this as quickly as I can, because I'm, I'm sure you have... Oh, we're doing okay, actually. Well, it's all relative, I guess. All right. Um, why here? Why did we have a super volcano explosion here? This can't be a subduction story, and we know that super volcanoes are not related to subduction anyways. So generally, we need a hot spot. There's an intimate connection between where hot spots are located underneath continents and supervolcano explosions. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, that's right on the mark. You need a heat source. You need a big heat source to melt up enough continental crust to create a big batch of this felsic magma and then create the supervolcano thing that we just saw. I was very happy with that little animation, that little mushroom thing. I and mean, I don't think that was an exaggeration either. Okay? 
So if you haven't heard this, it's going to go quick. If you have, it's going to go quick. There was a hot spot beneath the Bruno Jarbage caldera 11.81 million years ago. It was the Yellowstone hotspot. The Yellowstone hotspot appears to be moving. It appears to be moving. We think hotspots are fixed, fixed sources of heat. And instead of the hotspot moving, it's North America drifting over the top of the hotspot. But if you can do that in your mind and have this chalkboard drift to the southwest over a stationary hotspot, where's the hotspot today? What was it called again? What was that name? I didn't catch it. I didn't, what, well, ha ha, Yellowstone. And there is a caldera in Yellowstone National Park from the last explosion. I used to use a different date, but the date is more accurate now. The Lava Creek Welded Tough has been dated at 630,000 years ago. That's the most recent explosion from the Yellowstone hotspot supervolcano system. 630,000 years ago. Nothing's happened as far as a supervolcano explosion with this Yellowstone hotspot since 630,000 years ago. But if we jump back to 1.3 million years ago, there was a caldera from the Yellowstone hotspot system, created the Mesa Falls welded tough. If we go back a little bit younger yet, if we go back further in time, if we go back further in time, 2.1 million years ago, the famous Huckleberry Ridge welded tough. You see what we're doing. And there's welded tufts for each of these past supervolcano explosions. I don't even know who collected this or where they got it. But it's a welded tuft that has a specific age. We can visualize this pink welded tuft stuff for every one of these supervolcano events. But the pattern is the welded tufts get older as you go back in time. And yes, 11.81 million years ago, there's welded tuft from that it's called the Cougar Point Tough, the Cougar Point Welded Tough. And it turns out there's actually a dozen different Cougar Point Tufts, all from the same Bruno Jarbridge system. So there were 12 different supervolcano explosions making 12 different welded tufts just from this system here where the caldera was present. And a few of you adventurous people maybe have been down uh, taking a canyon trip a river trip, a hiking trip in the Bruno Canyon system or the Jarbage Canyon system. You're, that, that's all deep incision by rivers making a, a beautiful geologic cross-section through a supervolcano, through the caldera and through many of the welded tufts. But of course, we're not looking at the welded tuff where that video I just showed you up here in central Washington, Muffler Boy, good morning. Instead, this is the ash that fell out of the sky. So there's a welded tuff within 100 miles of this caldera, and at the same time, there's ash falling here, and there's ash falling in Nebraska at Ash Fall State Park, where rhinoceros in eastern Nebraska were uh, buried by uh, much ash, distracted by neighbors now. Good morning. Okay? Uh, so the last thing I want to do with you is to say... It looks like the hotspot's moving this way, but instead North America is moving uh, to the southwest over the top of this Yellowstone hotspot. And we have calderas that continue that trend. So the calderas and the welded tufts go from zero to five to 10 million years old to 15 million years old to 16 million years old to 17 million years old. And yes, if you listen to some of us, this is a developing idea, but it's an idea that I like very much, and I feel like there's enough evidence to share it with you. There are other supervolcano calderas that are older than 17 million years. The one I'd like to highlight is one that was originally in Northern California, 29.5 million years old. That's the Crooked River caldera. And you're like, hold on, I think I know where the Crooked River caldera is. It's 29 million years old. Yes, there's welded tuff from that supervolcano that made the Crooked River caldera. 
but Crooked River Caldera is not in California today, but it used to be. It wasn't called that then. Nobody named it 29.5 million years ago. But how many times have we looked at this already? We know that for at least 40 million years, there has been an ongoing clockwise rotation of the crust in the Pacific Northwest. And that clockwise rotation has taken these calderas that used to be lined up in California and has moved them varying numbers of miles away from their, their California location. And those calderas are now found throughout Oregon. Last thing I'll say, Again, depending on who you listen to, I guess you're listening to me right now. That hotspot originally was even offshore making a hole or no, making a volcano out in the ocean. And that can't be a super volcano though, right? Because our super volcanoes are only possible when we melt continental crust. So if we have a, a hot spot beneath an ocean floor, we're going to make a big pile of basalt. And that's what we did 56 million years ago to make Silesia. And if you're f confused by that, that was topic of a couple previous live streams. Okay, got the sun really changing position on me. I'm barely out of frame. I might even move this ladder here with the question and answer. But I feel like that's what I want to say to you, and it's 9.43. I'm getting longer and longer with these uh, sermons, basically. Um, hope you don't mind. This one has all sorts of juicy stuff. So it's time for some live Q&A with you. I think I am going to move the... Um, All right, questions from you, please. Why 30 feet of ash in Mattawa, Carlson family writes, and no layer of scale in vantage area? Oh, so that's an obvious question, and it's a good question. There's 30 feet of ash, I'm not flipping you off. It's Easter morning. There's 30 feet of ash in that location in Mattawa, but it's good morning. But as soon as you go 15 miles in any direction, you lose it. You go from 30 feet to nothing. Or over by Yakima, 30 feet to 6 inches. I'm talking about our 11.181 million years old Cougar Point Asphalt Tough. So that's an obvious question, one that I had when I first was brought to that private quarry. And I asked around as much as I could. And the short answer is, it seems like there's been some reworking of that ash. Like folks in Wyoming say, oh, you've been here in winter time? Yeah, when the snow hits the, when the snow comes out of the sky in the winter in my Wyoming ranch, that's just beginning of the travel of those snowflakes. In other words, they're gonna be blown all over the place by wind and big snow drifts and all sorts of things. And that's vaguely what I have in mind. That something uh, uh, collected a bunch of the volcanic ash. Maybe the ash was only a, f uh, only a, a foot thick or five feet thick or something, but it got swept into that hole somehow, that basin that's now 30 feet. So I think that's the, the best way to answer that question. Thank you for it. What's the name, rock name of the ash deposit? If we're talking about the 30 feet of ash, it's called the Cougar Point Tuff. There's plenty of scientific papers that I think you can find pretty easily online. Cougar Point Tough. I'm going to scroll back and try to get some early questions here. I'm always looking out for children's questions, but um, um, I'm sorry if, if I don't get to yours. Is there any sign of the Yellowstone hotspot moving to the northeast? Good question. By the way, there's a guy named, uh, oh boy, Mike Poland. Uh, who is the, the chief scientist now at the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. If you want a good uh, YouTube channel to follow, it's the Yellowstone, I think it's 
the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory YouTube channel. Anyway, if you can find it, Mike Poland gives a an update on Yellowstone activity at the beginning of every month. And it's fast paced and it's full of uh, uh, observational information. And he's a great resource and does a really fine job spreading the word uh, about what, what's been going on. Uh, that's me stalling and trying to think, do I know anything about a migrating hotspot? Like, is there any physical evidence that the hotspot has moved in the last 600,000 years? And I think the answer is no. I think that the majority of that hot, that heat in the hot spot is, is, well, basically there's debate about how broad or how wide on a map the Yellowstone hotspot really is. Um, and so from this pattern, of course, you think, well, the next time it goes, it's going to be to the northeast. And in general, that's true. But these calderas overlap and it's not quite as simple as I'm drawing it. Uh, that's my best answer there. Um, you caught those last three dates, you know, there's 600,000 years between events and it's been 600,000 years. So there's cause for slight concern, but the errors on our dates are so big and there's no obvious ratcheting up of activity to us in science. Now I know that the media has taken this and, and, uh, and created all sorts of clickbait to get people to you know, oh, Yellowstone's about to blow and it's overdue. And that's, there's no science behind any of those statements and it ticks me off. Well, craters of the moon. Well, 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 look who we have, craters of the moon. <laughs> craters of the moon is here. It's basalt that's 2,000 years old. I don't totally understand why those basalts came up in craters of the moon. It's so young, and it's not the rhyolite, right? It's basalt. That's a whole nother part of this story, that these calderas are all buried by young basalts. So if you want to go down there and you know drive through these circular calderas, you can't see them. You can only see the youngest Yellowstone caldera. The rest are buried by basalts. And it's a story about bimodal volcanism where you can get both the explosive rhyolites and these fluid basalts from the same system. And there's still a little bit of work to do on, on why the basalts are coming up. But it's so darn young that I almost feel like Craters of the Moon is tied more to the basin and range extension than it is the Yellowstone story. And I, that's what I did my master's thesis on, the intersection of the basin and range normal faults and the uh, subsidence of the Eastern Snake River Plain. But I'm 30 years out of date with what's been going on research-wise. Thank you. Yeah, craters to the moon. Gotta love it. Uh, let me keep going. I'm scrolling. I'm way back now and I'm scrolling uh, closer to present day, I guess. I'm looking for uppercase, you know about that. Are there Tianaway rhyolites from a supervolcano eruption? Are there welded tufts in the Tianaway? Thanks for the question, Justin. Uh, so there's this place north of Ellensburg called the Tianaway River Valley. And there is Tianaway basalt that's 49 million years old. And that's one of the things I'm currently interested in is that there is some rhyolite in the Tianaway formation. And it's unclear if that rhyolite in the Tianaway area is 49 million years old or 44 million years old or as young as 24 million years old. And if it is, is any of it welded tough? Is there any ash fall from the Tianaway story? Not that I know of. And some of the locals that are up there, Wes Engstrom and a few others are convinced, Rob Reppin is convinced that there's kind of a buried caldera like a, maybe a super volcano called Dara in the Tianaway area, but I don't think we have that yet. Maybe we never will. And if, there, if we can get to a point where we do have a super volcano called Dara in the central Washington, why? That's more tied to the Chalice Magma story that we were dealing with earlier. So anyway, um, I, I don't, I, I'll keep moving here. Thanks. That, that's, a, that's a story in the works. Why is it called tough? I'm not sure. 
origin of many of these words, I, I, I don't usually know. Are there multiple ash flow tusks from the multiple calderas over the time? Absolutely. So, you know, for years, even when I would, by the way, the word supervolcano wasn't even my master's thesis in 1989. The, the use of this new word, supervolcano, has kind of gotten into the pop culture and also, I think, um, uh, the scientific literature as well. But there were a lot of welded tufts that we didn't even really know the age yet, and we didn't know which caldera it, it belonged to, essentially. So, yes, there are many, many ash flow tufts. This is what I did want to say, though. If there's so much ash, you remember my, the animation and the, and the huge cloud? How many of these ash beds that we assume are from the Cascades are actually from the Yellowstone system? Like, where's all this ash fall? Does it all get eroded away? That's a, that's a reasonable question, I think. Um, so my gut feeling is that there's going to be more and more that we kind of discover, especially with Barb Nash's new techniques. We're going to realize there's more and more of a super volcano story up here in Washington than previously viewed. Even our, flood, even our German chocolate cake drink, even our German chocolate cakes are tied to this Yellowstone story. And we made that point with that live stream. Uh, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Are hotspots older than supercontinents? Good question, don't know. There's major questions about hotspots. Why are they located where they are? Have they always been there? Is it tied to some sort of extraterrestrial thing, punching the earth and making a hotspot? And since we don't know those answers, then I, we, I don't know what to say about the age of them. What's the size of the Yellowstone hotspot? There's a lot of misinformation out there. It's because we still don't really know. It's back to an earth interior story. Uh, but they, generally, you know, we've got our super volcano vo uh, calderas and our deposits. Uh, I visualize kind of a, a big broad head of heat, but uh, I, I don't, I don't really even really know what that's based on now that I drew it. Plenty we don't know with this discussion, which always, everybody has different reactions to that. You know, there's haters out there. So when you say, we don't really know, it's like, I knew it. All that, all that tax money and those guys don't know a damn thing. It's just all your agendas and your universities are, no, we it's an honest appraisal. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. That's what science is. We're constantly gathering new information. We don't. It's Easter morning. <clears throat> oh, are the bandolier tufts and bishop tuff from super volcanoes? Yes, Bill. So I did jot down. <clears throat> I'll give it to you verbally. I don't want to draw it all out. Um, but we quantify the amount of ash, whether it's ash, tough, ash flow tough or ash fall. Uh, we, we, there's a way to quantify that, like give a feeling for how much came out of a certain eruption. So Mount St. Helens, that's one cubic kilometer. If you can visualize like a, a big cardboard box, it's like a half a mile by a half a mile by a half a mile. So you take all the stuff that came out of St. Helens in 1980, it fits into one of those cubic kilometers. Krakatoa, 1883, 18 cubic kilometers. Mazama, 43 cubic kilometers. We're still under 100 cubic kilometers. But if we jump to the Valles Caldera in New Mexico, there's 400 cubic kilometers, including the Bandelier Tuff, which is 1.2 million years old. The Long Valley, now we're, now we're in supervolcano category, absolutely. So there's a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous, Caldera, called the Valles Caldera in, uh, near Santa Fe and 400 cubic kilometers. There's a beautiful circular caldera south of Reno, north of Bishop, California, called the Long Valley Caldera. It last exploded 760,000 years ago, made the Bishop tough, 700 cubic kilometers. We're comparing to one cubic kilometer of Mount St. Helens. I'm gonna keep going. The, the Tapau, sorry if I got it wrong, Taupo, uh, New Zealand supervolcano, 26,500 years ago, 1,200 cubic kilometers. Some of these Yellowstone events that I just told you about, Huckleberry Ridge, Lava Creek Falls, etc., 
uh, 2,000 cubic kilometers. Toba in Indonesia, 70,000 years ago, 3,000 cubic kilometers. And some newly discovered supervolcano calderas in the Rockies, the La Garita caldera and ash flow tuff, 28 million years old, 5,000 cubic, 5, cubic kilometers. And the Wawa Springs in Nevada, 30, uh, 30 million years ago, 5,500 cubic kilometers. So, I mean, these are mind-blowing numbers. The, the deposits continue just to be mapped at a pretty basic level. Uh, so I, I think this is a story that's going to continue to grow. Our appreciation, understanding, and kind of inventory of supervolcano calderas and deposits around the world. There's been an, no pun intended, there's been an explosion in our knowledge just in the last 20 years, from my point of view. I thought a supervolcano can blow out the sun worldwide, true or false? Oh, blot out the sun, sorry. Well, uh, seems pretty obvious to me with those numbers I just gave you that we're going to be in darkness for days, weeks, years. It's a lot of ash, right? It's got to be true. Would the hotspot even be a hotspot if silica was lower? Would it not break through? Would the hotspot even be a hotspot if the silica was lower? Well, even our, our flood basalts are coming up through fissures, and those ultimately were fueled by the Yellowstone hotspot story. We're pretty sure with the timing of at least the heat source. So I think I would think of it as, as uh, magmas are coming from different levels in the crust, and even some of the, the magma is coming from the lower crust, which is really just a direct result of getting some hot mantle material to come up. So with these hot spots, you're creating different, you're, you're creating both basalts and rhyolites. I know that's confusing now because we just separated those out on the whiteboard, but we're advanced now with our discussion and the heat, the hot spot is creating shallow crustal and deep crustal magma systems. Was Mount Mazama a supervolcano? Well, that's a tough one. My quick answer is Mount Mazama is still in this category. It's a cascade volcano and it's, you know, it's, it's in the subduction zone area. But Mazama was 43 times the volume of St. Helens. So we're kind of in this neighborhood now of, we're not really behaving like a regular cone volcano. And I think I just read this morning online that Toba, which whatever that was, was more of a cone than it was a supervolcano. Not sure that's true or not, but there's, there's this range that I don't totally understand. And there's even the Kolshan caldera up by Bellingham, which appears to be kind of a supervolcano structure, even though it's kind of in the Cascades. So to me, that's a major question mark. Maybe others have figured it out, but great question. I, we may be in neighboring, we may be in the neighborhood of a supervolcano with Mazama. How do we know there was not a volcano similar to Mount Mazama that got blown off? If you mean in Idaho, there's no evidence of that. I'm not sure what the context otherwise is. Remember what our evidence is, and we can only kind of confine our stuff to our evidence. Well, more automatic scrolling. I'll never figure that out. Do we know how long a particular eruptive period lasts? For the supervolcano? No, we don't have that precision. 11.81 um, million years old sounds pretty precise, but there's errors of thousands of years on either side of that date. So we can guess, but there's no way to really document that. Hoping that you do a geology of Highway 2 someday. Okay. Are the geologic magnetic convergences tied to hotspots? Are the magnetic field reversals I'm not sure what you mean by convergences, but we know a fair amount about the history of our magnetic field on planet Earth, and I, I don't know of a, a connection at all to hotspots. How many times has Yellowstone 
going on, going off. Well, if we're just talking about Yellowstone within Yellowstone Park, I would say three major eruptions. Keep tripping on my stuff here. Uh, the last three major eruptions in Yellowstone Park have erupted every 600,000 years or so. If you mean the, the long-term history of the Yellowstone hotspot, we have dozens, I'll just say that, dozens of past explosions. Is it 600,000 years between every explosion? Uh, we don't have enough dates and enough deposits to make that case, but it wouldn't be crazy. Yeah, Wawa Springs, the last one I said. Don't know if I named it. Is the ash chemistry changing as the continent moves over the hotspot? Interesting. Um, I don't know of a trend. It would be a subtle chemistry difference, I would think. But the, I will say this, that if you were with us for our exotic terrain talk or our supercontinent talk, remember right where my hand is, is a boundary between old, thick Precambrian craton, which is like the old foundation of North America. And over here is just a bunch of these scraps of crust, many of them coming up from Mexico. So the hotspot coming and burning holes through the exotic terrain material is going to create some different chemistries than the, never even thought about that till right now. So is the chemistry of Crooked River Caldera, for instance, significantly different? That's a question for Jason McGlowry of uh, the Oregon, based out of Baker City. Is the ash up Highway 10 towards Kalielum from Bruno? No. Um, that's all Cascade stuff. About 10 million years old from a ghost volcano near um, Bumping Lake. Will Laurentia have a dampening effect on the hotspot? Are these hotspots fixed and old? And it doesn't matter if a super volcano is sitting on top of them or not? Or are these hotspots getting set up since the last supercontinent? Don't know. Why is there so much water on the continental divide? I don't understand why you're asking that today. I don't even understand the question, I'm sorry. Do you think the recent deformation of Yellowstone is the magma chamber refilling? Um, there have been some interesting, again, if, if you're very interested in Yellowstone and the supervolcano that we have today in Yellowstone and the, and the activity of it, please go to the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory website. They have all this wonderful data there. You're getting it straight from the horse's mouth. You're not getting it through some program. Um, I made this comment on the YouTube lecture. Uh, it's tough if you make video programs about super volcanoes because there's no footage to show. You can do an animation like I just showed you, but otherwise you, you, you need some stuff to put on the screen. And so it leads to all these inaccuracies and your people are learning about Yellowstone and they're seeing orange lava in Hawaii. It's like it doesn't even work. So. Get rid of the middleman. I guess I'm talking about me now. Get rid of me and go right to the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory site. That's a way, a way to answer your question. There's all sorts, you remember those GPS receivers? There's all sorts of GPS receivers on, uh, the, on the Yellowstone hotspot. And within the caldera, and there's even things called research... There's something called a resurgent dome where we've had our big supervolcano explosions in the past. We now have this obvious caldera. Let's call it the Yellowstone caldera, 600 and whatever thousand years old. There's been some younger lavas. The last major basalt eruption was about 70,000 years ago in Yellowstone Park. And then there's these humps these domes of rhyolite lava that are within the national park. I'm talking about Yellowstone National Park itself now, inside of the Yellowstone caldera. And those domes have GPS receivers on them. And Yellowstone today is like a breathing animal. Like there'll be months of very tiny but steady inflation 
of these resurgent domes. Like the, 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 the land is definitely lifting. And then there are months where thing, the, those, those resurgent dome surfaces are, are deflating. So, you know, we've been doing this with this kind of high precision uh, surveying, basically, uh, for the last, I don't know, 30 years maybe. And, you know, people are studying these patterns, but it's not just an inflation or a deflation. There's, there's this, this fluctuation of activity that's kind of cool, but if you're observing in such a short window, just 30 years, and you're trying to say something about a system that has a periodicity of hundreds of thousands of years, I don't, I don't see how you can say much except just documenting what we're observing in our short time on the planet. I'm confused about obsidian. That's embarrassing to say. There's a Newberry volcano in central Oregon. Where's that obsidian? Now the rock hounds are going to uh, shout now because I don't really know exactly where this obsidian is. I think it's from Oregon somewhere. Probably not Newberry, but... Um, I've been meaning to try to just learn some basic things about obsidian. I don't understand it. Much of the obsidian is, is rhyolite. It's, it's high silica stuff, but, and I know that the magma is chilling very quickly, and I'm sure you've got some comments here that you know exactly how obsidian forms, but to me, it doesn't totally make sense. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer questions about obsidian. And I wouldn't say that obsidian is a major part of our supervolcano story, but there are obsidian domes that are found within supervolcano structures. How are we doing? Oh, Lord, we're after the top of the hour. Let's do a few more. Are large igneous provinces results of supervolcanoes? Well, in the grandest scheme of things, there are these amazing flood basalt provinces. As you mentioned in your question, the Siberian uh, flood basalts, the Indian flood basalts, the Columbia River basalt flood basalts. And is there a supervolcano heat source or a hotspot heat source? I don't know the answer, by the way, so I'm just thinking to myself. So in the case of our flood basalts, just to the south, there's supervolcano calderas. I haven't looked into India or Russia to know if they have supervolcano calderas of rhyolite nearby that match the age. So I don't know. So you can potentially tie a bunch of things together. This is conjecture now. No, it's not conjecture. It's, it's been published for a long time. But the details of making the connections are still in doubt. But Flood basalts, these large igneous provinces, hot spots, and the ages of those tied to mass extinctions, and yes, I'm willing to say it, significant global climate change, are all interconnected. It can't be a coincidence that all four of those things are happening at specific times in our geologic history. Massive outpourings of basalt, mass extinctions of most life on planet Earth. And, and how does that connect to some of this supervolcano stuff? I mean, we, we, we it, it's, it's uh, I'm not, no. I'm not ready to, to share those things. Mahogany Obsidian, thank you. Hi, Patrick. I can't find your question, Patrick, sorry. If older calderas are buried under basalt flows, how are geologists finding the old calderas? Good question. So, um, shut up. So we're talking now about the Snake River. This is the last, last thing I'll say. So we're talking about the Snake River Plain in Idaho. And in cross-section, so let's go... Uh, Let's make a cross section from A to A prime on this map. And here's A to A prime, and here's, here's a couple of Mormon farmers. 
growing potatoes on the Snake River Plain. Okay? Map, cross section. So it's basalt making up the flat surface of the upper, let's say, a mile uh, of the Snake River Plain. Yes, including Craters of the Moon. And then we only have one visible supervolcano caldera in Yellowstone. But we can make a bunch of buried calderas, buried calderas underneath the flat basalt of I-84 as you drive from Twin Falls to Pocatello. So the question is a good one. How do we know these things are even down there? Well, 30 years ago when I was doing that work, there were kind of kind of guess guess type maps about the margins because they're completely buried in basalt. But there's new techniques to do seismic tomography and to send kind of basically man-made earthquake signals through here and get kind of a cat scan of what's down there. And they can they can see those old calderas now. Plus where I was doing my work as a graduate student at Idaho State University under the tutelage of Dave, David W. Rogers, I was mapping the Heisey volcanic field, which are some uh, welded tufts from some completely buried uh, uh, supervolcano calderas on the northern margin of the Snake River Plain. If you know Idaho and the southern tip of the Lemhi Range and the southern tip of the Lost River Range, in Lighty Hot Springs specifically. And so those welded tufts I have not been buried because they're, they're kind of on the shoulders in these kind of uh, slightly elevated areas. So there's been all this work here to work with the welded tufts and then make pretty detailed inferences of where those supervolcano calderas used to be. And in the case of our buddy, the Bruno Jarbage caldera, we actually have a river canyon the Bruno River, the Jarbage River, actually dissecting and getting down at least to the welded tufts, maybe into the caldera itself. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that much. I said that was it, but I got to do one more. I got to look for a couple of children questions if they're here. I see the word Evelyn. Do you think Evelyn and I can go with you soon? Sure. I guess I've hit most of this. I'm sorry if I'm not seeing your question. Okay, a toast. It's a special morning for some of us. And I wanna thank you for joining us. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of your parents and grandparents. Here's to the health of your children and grandchildren. Here's to the health of our health care workers and other folks who are working hard to keep us going. And here's to the Easter Bunny and any other hallowed personalities that we're thinking of today. Thanks for joining us this morning. I won't see you tomorrow.
I'll see you on Tuesday to talk about Seattle geology, Wednesday to talk about Snoqualmie Pass geology, Thursday to talk about Yakima River Canyon, Saturday morning to talk about columnar basalt, including hate mail, and Sunday morning to talk about continental drift, plate tectonics, and the history of the universe. Have a good day. Enjoy your family and your friends the best you can. And we'll see you Tuesday night. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington. I love you.